Thank you. Thanks very much, Dave. Uh, appreciate it. And thanks to all of you for being here tonight. I, I very much appreciate uh, your time and efforts in joining me in probing the question of thought causation and whether, in fact, we are beings whose experiences, whose lives, whose concrete reference points, the empiricism that we experience, is uh, the result of uh, visualized ideas, expectations, emotive thoughts, mental pictures pushed out into the world. This is a concept that has animated my own search for many years, and I view all of you on this program tonight, uh, everyone who corresponds with me, uh, the readers of my books, the people that I, I meet at conferences, as co-seekers, you know, and, and seeker is the only title I've ever claimed for myself. I don't think of myself as um, any kind of a life coach or a guru or a teacher. I think of myself strictly as a seeker. If I'm speaking in literary terms, I would describe myself also as a historian. Uh, I always hasten to add that I'm a believing historian. I participate in the movements that I write about, and I think being close to the movements that you write about can actually heighten your sense of critical acumen and a wish for those movements to be accountable to the people who, who are part of them and to deliver a real concrete benefit in conduct and in experience uh, to the lives of people who follow the ideas of a different movement, whether it be therapeutic or social or ethical or philosophical, or in this case, uh, spiritual. Um, I was uh, looking at a transcript this morning from several years ago from a online chat that I had done with listeners of the radio show Coast to Coast AM, which I'm on from time to time. And uh, some years ago, uh, as a bonus to its, its viewers, the show offered this, this online chat. And at the top of the chat, I was asked a very moving question by someone. And um, in a certain sense, looking back on it, I don't feel that I took a full stock of his question. I, I thought his question was of a, a higher caliber uh, than, than my response at the time. And uh, his name was Matt C. For all I know, maybe he's on this program with us this evening. And I wanted to revisit Matt C.'s question, which I thought was really thoughtful and worthwhile, especially apropos of our topic tonight, Empire of Mind. And give it a more thoughtful consideration uh, here at the outset of um, this evening's program. Um, what he asked was based on an analysis of the New Age and alternative spiritual culture by a very probing and deeply critical and discerning social critic named Christopher Lash, who's deceased today. And Lash made the case that popular spiritual movements New Age movements, therapeutic spiritual movements, alternative spiritual movements that are not necessarily part of any particular congregation or doctrine, which includes uh, New Thought or the movement around thought causation that I consider myself a, a, a part of. Um, he felt that these movements displayed two primary forms of narcissism, obsession with self. The first form, he felt, was demonstrated through people who were trying to get back to some sense of being safe again in the womb, and they wanted to kind of dissolve their lives into a kind of numinosity, dissolve their lives into an ocean of consciousness or nirvana, which, which Lash felt was a kind of escape from reality, a kind of escape from the inevitability of death, an escape from the disappointments of life, and a wish to ensconce oneself in a safe little uh, womb again. And he felt that a secondary form of narcissism 
that was also seen within the alternative spiritual culture, within the New Thought culture, um, was in some ways a mirror image of that, rather than wanting to dissolve oneself into this ocean of, of being or numinosity or nirvana. The other form of narcissist, the secondary kind of narcissist, was kind of a wild egotist, was somebody who wanted to push his or her way through life and was unwilling to acknowledge the barriers to gratification. Probably that would have been Lash's critique of the New Thought movement, a movement that sees the mind as a kind of medium for attainment, for realization of self, especially in a worldly sense. And the questioner pointed out, he may have been referencing Lash in this regard, that the figure of Narcissus in classical mythology fell in love with his image reflected in a body of water, but he didn't think it was him. He thought it was somebody else. He thought it was somebody secondary. And in a certain sense, as Lash saw it, this is the kind of narcissism that we can get caught up in, where we project ourselves onto the world and we believe that the world reflects back to us whatever it is that we wish for, either in terms of attainment and ambition or in terms of being this very boundaryless, numinous, safe, nirvana-like place that we can just kind of dissolve ourselves into. And my answer, you know, at the time when I was asked whether I thought that critique was a valid critique of New Age culture, New Thought culture, the culture of mind causation, was that although I enormously respected Lash as a social critic and considered him a tremendously trenchant and insightful intellect, I felt that he, like many other scholars and commentators, operated at too far a remove, at too great a remove from the New Age and New Thought culture that he was seeking to critique and that he simply was unfamiliar with many of its historical antecedents and the different and various strands and forms that it took. And I suppose to some extent I stand by that, that response, I stand by that response, but I feel as though I feel as though we as seekers need to at least wrestle with the question of whether the spiritual uh, search is a kind of escape from reality or a wish to project ourselves onto reality and inflate ourselves up and, and build ourselves up. And I've wrestled with this you know, for a long time because I take seriously, as I'm going to talk about tonight, the contention that thoughts are causative. I think there's, there's too much that we've seen in the sciences, in psychology, in the testimony of seekers, in placebo studies, in neuroplasticity, in mind-body medicine, and now in studies that touch upon questions of interdimensionality, string theory, quantum mechanics, the observer effect. I think we've seen too much and have witnessed over the past 150 years an ever-increasing and ever-expanded definition of the mind's agencies and possibilities, a definition that never recedes but always expands. We've seen too much of that to avoid the conclusion that an individual's thoughts are more than just analytic or cognitive or motor skill based, but have a very concrete, very real capacity to affect not only the tenor of that person's life, but the tenor of what experiences actually enter into that life in the most concrete terms. And one of the things I've asked myself is, 
you know, if I'm right about the mind causation thesis, then it begs the question of what is it for? You know, what is it for? It returns us to Christopher Lash's critique. You know, is his worldly ambition is the wish to create, is the wish to, to produce, to earn, to generate, to be a certain way. Is that a worthy end of the spiritual search? And I've wrestled with that question for many, many years. And the place that I've come to, um, the perspective that I've come to on that on that question, on that conflict, yeah. is that I really have ceased to differentiate between what might be considered eternal and temporal values. I think it's an artificial division that has been kind of forced upon us almost by the force of familiarity because so much in Eastern and Western religious thought tells us that we live in this kind of hierarchical world, a world in which things that are essential, things that are eternal, things that are sacred, that are everlasting, that belong to the greater you somehow are of a, a kind of higher degree or sphere of existence that, that, that we're sort of building towards as we shed worldly attachments and illusions, sometimes called maya or samsara, um, as we realize that attachments breed suffering and so forth. And, you know, this idea in both Eastern and Western religion, I think, does not suit the life and the search of the 21st century seeker. And I think that it, it, it warrants re-examination in our generation. Because I think that we've gotten into this kind of division in which we think of things in terms of attachment and non-attachment. Uh, personality and essence, ego and true self, eternal and temporal. And I don't know where you would necessarily even draw those lines of demarcation. You know, a friend of mine used to joke that if, if I sort of demonstrate something and I like it, I say that must come from essence. And if I demonstrate something, I evince some sort of behavior and I don't like it, I say that must come from personality, you know. And how would we demarcate when personality uh, blends into essence, uh, when a, a more temporal desire uh, blends into or gives way to a more eternal desire? How would I evaluate what's needed, what's necessary in your life? You know, and my sense of things at this moment in my search, and I share this with you very frankly, is that the essential purpose of life is self-expression, self-expression which can take any number of forms that are intimately important and necessary to you. And I am opposed to nothing other than barriers being thrown up between an individual and, and his or her sense of, of self-expression. The only thing that I stand against, you know, the only kind of moral code that I suppose I employ on the path is I, I would never do anything to block or deter another person from striving for the same human potential that I wish for, for myself. And 
I would never do anything to demean, uh, not knowingly, another community or individual or dehumanize another community or individual, which is really the same thing as trying to deter or disassemble that person's ability or that community's ability to strive for self-potential. And what self-potential is, what self-expression is, is exquisitely private and intimate. You know, it belongs to you. It belongs to you. I think that we live in an age where we are fed too many off-the-shelf ideas, including within our alternative and our mainstream religious cultures about what constitutes the search, about what constitutes progress on the path. How would one evaluate progress on the path? The only thing I think that evaluates the success of a philosophy, a therapy, an ethics, a religion, a spiritual point of view, is the conduct of the seeker and the experience of the seeker. The capacity to enter into and sustain satisfying relationships, the capacity to find one's way in the material world in some way that's reasonably self-sustaining, and above all, the capacity for individual expression. In scripture, we're told that the creator fashioned the human in, in, in its own image. In hermetic philosophy, in the document that's sometimes known as the Emerald Tablet, a similar idea appeals, a, appears as above, so below. As above, so below. If the notion of as above, so below, or the notion that the individual is created in the image of the creator, if those things actually mean anything, and they're really at the heart of Western and Near Eastern religion, they're at the heart of the Abrahamic and, and the Hermetic Egyptian religious model, if those things mean anything, then they have to mean that you, the individual, ought to be able to create within your own sphere in the same way that you were created. And created from what? You know, created from what? The ancient Greek Egyptian thought school known as Hermeticism held to the principle that all of creation emanated from some kind of infinite stuff, stuff from which nothing could be added to and nothing could be subtracted from, stuff that had no proportion, stuff that couldn't be measured, limited, or contained within any conceptions of time, space, geometry. And, and so the, the, the one thing that we consensually understand as fitting that description would be thought, would be thought. And the Hermeticists use a Greek term, nous, nous, to refer to a great overmind that they saw, saw as the source of all creation. And they believe that each individual emanates through concentric spheres of creation. To put it in the plainest terms, from this one great higher mind. And that the individual, him or herself, can create within the sphere, the cosmic framework, the physical framework in which, in which the individual finds him or herself. But Hermeticism also holds that we are limited by the laws and forces that exist within our physical framework, which can be many, which can be many. I think we live under immensely different laws and forces of which the law of mind, the law of creation, the capacities of thought are one, are one. And it could be, it could very well be that thought itself is the ultimate arbiter of experience and there's so much uh, within our world, both within religious tradition and within the sciences to suggest that 
thought is an ultimate arbiter of reality, but because a law is ever present doesn't mean it's always experienced in the same way. H2O is always water, but water can be a, 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 a vapor, a liquid, or a solid, depending upon temperature. Gravity is always constant, it's ever operative, it's really its mass being attracted to itself. But you're obviously going to experience gravity very differently on the moon than you would on Jupiter, or on Earth, or on Saturn, or in the vacuum of space where it would seem to be entirely absent. But it's not entirely absent because objects are still drawn towards one another from fantastically far distances. And it could very well be that the law of mental creativity works the same way. It's ever operative. But there are all kinds of other forces that mitigate your experience of it. Including physical limitations that we may that we may experience within this sphere. And and yet we get such tantalizing possibilities. We, we, I think probably everybody uh, joining in this program this evening has had his or her moments of just the most extraordinary congruities between thought and event. The most extraordinary congruities between thought and event. I'll share one of my own uh, with you. Several years ago, um, I was involved in a very a rigorous, very demanding uh, esoteric order. Um, the people in it, uh, by and large, were very intellectually refined. The quality of thought, the quality of questioning, um, the rigor of search was very deeply felt. There were physical demands placed on people. People really could be pushed to their physical limits. And man, nothing kills fantasies about yourself quicker than being, you know, woken up at four in the morning to go clean out a toilet and, you know, see how you're doing. You know, I mean, when you discover what it's like to have to do things in atmospheres that are unfamiliar or that are physically uncomfortable, you realize your limitations very quickly and it kills fantasies that, that you have about yourself. Um, and so we were engaged in an activity where uh, we were going on this winter camping trip. And for those of you who have ever gone on winter camping trips in the northeastern United States, this was in Pennsylvania, uh, you know, it's brutal. I was once going on a winter camping trip and I asked a very good friend of mine to come. I prevailed upon him to come and he insistently refused and I said, why not? And he said, because the best you could possibly hope for is to have a terrible time. And he was absolutely correct. We spent the entire trip basically just trying to stay alive, um, which is not the way everybody wants to spend their weekends. But we were going on this winter camping trip with a real sense of purpose. We were gathering in the woods to be together as part of the search. and. Um, my, my teacher, the, 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 the head of this particular group, uh, gave me a particular job to do. Uh, and there was a little humor mixed in with this, but nonetheless, it, it, it was, it was veritable. He said that, uh, the, um, the women in the group, uh, were going to be staying in, uh, tents, you know, in the freezing cold. And, um, uh, the men were staying inside of a cold water cabin, which probably wasn't any warmer. Um, and he said that uh, if, 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 if the female campers had to get up at night and relieve themselves in order that they wouldn't have to go out into the freezing cold, icy uh, winter woods at night, uh, I should go and buy uh, buckets for their tents to serve as chamber pots, basically. But these buckets, he said with a, a, a glint in his eye, had to be of a particular type. They had to be pink and heart-shaped. So there was a little humor in this, but he was also intending to give me a difficult task. 
with a, with a, with a purpose, with an end purpose in mind. And he said, um, if I couldn't find buckets, after really trying, that were pink and, and heart-shaped, um, it would be acceptable for me to buy uh, red buckets. And if I really, really was down on my luck, I could buy you know, regular red round buckets. So I uh, was living in New York City at the time, where I'm speaking from tonight. And I went out, this was several years ago, I went out on a big search looking for these pink heart-shaped buckets, and I couldn't find them anywhere. And I mean, I really searched. I didn't want to disappoint um, the man who was giving me this task, I felt it was very important that I put everything into it, and I made phone calls, and I visited bed bath stores, and hardware stores, and home goods stores, contractor stores. I could not find pink heart-shaped buckets anywhere. So I decided I would go to plan B. I would look for red buckets didn't seem too hard a task you know if i went deep into plan b i would just get these you know regular red plastic buckets now mind you this was before the full advent of digital commerce where you know you just go onto amazon or whatever and you know you buy whatever you want so i had to really do some serious looking now weirdly enough here i am in new york city one of the commercial hubs of the world. I couldn't even find the red buckets. I'm calling hardware stores. I'm going all around paint stores, contractor stores, bed bath stores. And this is just getting ridiculous. I couldn't even find the red buckets. And so one evening, um, I was uh, running out on a quick uh, household errand. And I had my old-fashioned cell phone with me. This wasn't an iPhone or anything like that. And uh, I said to myself, well, I'm just going to call my teacher, and I'm going to tell him that um, I tried, but, but I failed. I've searched for these pink heart-shaped buckets. They're nowhere to be found in New York City. I went to Plan B. I searched for red heart-shaped buckets, then just regular red circular buckets and I've, I've gotten, I've gotten nowhere. I've, I've failed. But something told me, you know, just wait, just, 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 just wait a little bit. And as I was going through all this in my mind, I was standing outside of this little around the block neighborhood grocery store, which, um, was just some place you know you'd run in to pick up milk or eggs or something like that and so I went into this kind of nothing little grocery store around the block headed to the back to the frozen food section where I was probably getting some milk or something and right there was a gleaming brand new pile of pink heart-shaped buckets. And I grabbed a, a stock boy and I said, just check me on this. What color are those buckets? And he said, pink. And I said, and they're heart-shaped. And he said, yeah. And I said, when did these things come in? He said, they just came in today. We just got them. And I was absolutely blown away. Because not only were the circumstances of finding these buckets infinitesimally small, and even if you use the law of large numbers, which would dictate that weird things have to happen to somebody based on such and such a population sample, the number was infinitesimally small. But there was another factor as well. And this is very important to remember. Even when you're dealing with actuarial tables or large numbers or statistical probabilities across a whole vast populace, there's one thing that 
laws of statistics cannot really get at, and that is the emotional stakes that are felt intimately by the individual. What it is that the individual is is invested with apropos of the thing being sought. The relationship, the job, the need, the stranger that you run into who helps you, the friend that you've been out of touch with for some crazy number of years who, who you know, you run into in the most unlikely of place. The emotional stakes that you, the individual, feel in a certain situation narrow odds down to a point where they're literally unmeasurable. And that's what I experienced in that situation. And it affirmed for me an ineffable truth, an ineffable truth, that there is something lawful about mental exertion, something that goes beyond the cognitive, something that goes beyond motor skill. And it seems to me, it seems to me, and this is just one aspect of the mind causation thesis, but it's one that I feel particularly moved to share with you tonight. It seems to me that the trigger of deliverance behind the efficacy of thought, behind the ability of thought to concretize circumstance another topic which I'm going to touch upon before we're through tonight, is the uniqueness and the dedication of the individual's totality of persistence, mental and otherwise. There seems to me to be almost a rhythmical swing Again, this kind of takes us back to the hermetic expression of as above, so below, which I think is, 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 is very much intended as a kind of overlaw of nature, both visible and invisible. There seems to me to be a kind of rhythmic swing that requires of necessity a mirroring swing a mirroring swing. Isaac Newton made the observation, and this has been validated both in macro and particle physics, that objects at vast distances from one another have inexplicable effects on one another, precise mirroring effects that we've never been fully able to understand. String theory, on which I will comment, is one of the interdimensional theories that has been developed to try to explain, among other things, the mirror effect. And it seems to me that when we dedicate ourselves to an ideal, whatever it may be, and we bring a totality of effort, mental and otherwise, emotional and otherwise, industrious and otherwise, and we bring a totality of effort concentrated on that point, that need, that wish. I believe that we set in motion a kind of rhythmical swing and it's impossible that there won't be a corresponding motion, a corresponding motion that moves us in the direction of the aim, the goal, the wish, the need, provided it's felt with sufficient passion and provided our concentration is exquisitely focused. Why? Why would any of that be? Is this all just metaphor, you know, that I'm speaking in? Just a pretty way of talking about the nature of persistence? It seems to me that our senses, our senses, if we want to get down to definitions, are really instruments uh, of measurement. They're instruments of measurement. 
you know, what else is, is sight, touch, taste, smell, hearing? And we've experienced indelible evidence over the course of now 90 years of particle physics experiments, indelible evidence that on the subatomic scale, a particle exists in what is called a wave state or a state of superposition and is not actually localized until a sentient observer makes the decision to take a measurement. No one challenges this data. The data itself is uncontroversial. What's controversial are the implications of the data. And the implications of the data are becoming more and more important because we are encountering parallel insights in other sciences, such as, for example, in the field of neuroplasticity, which uses brain scans to measure the nature, the form, and the formation of neural pathways in your brain through which electrical impulses travel. Scientists in the field of neuroplasticity have been demonstrating since the 1990s that sustained and directed thoughts actually alter the neural pathways in your brain, actually alter the pathways through which electrical impulses travel in your brain. And this is used sometimes to treat people who suffer from OCD or addictions or ritualistic behavior or intrusive thoughts or what have you. And it's been demonstrated that if the individual can sustainably redirect his or her thoughts for a dedicated period of time, sometimes several weeks, new neural pathways actually form in the brain in response to thought, something that is supposed to be an epiphenomenon of the brain. And yet, what we're witnessing in neuroplasticity, and again, the data is uncontroversial. The implications are controversial. What we're witnessing is literal mind over matter. We're witnessing selection, perspective, affecting measurable material substance, exactly like what occurs when a wave state collapses into a particle state in the quantum physics lab based on the perspective of the observer, based on the decision of the sentient observer to take a measurement or not take a measurement at a given moment. Likewise, in neuroplasticity, the perspective, the thought patterns of the observer actually determines and affects what will physically appear on brain scans when you're measuring for neural activity. We are seeing new frontiers in the presence of a kind of mental force. If I can put it in those terms, that's a term that one of the pioneers of neuroplasticity uses, Jeffrey M. Schwartz, a, a research psychologist at, at UCLA. He speaks in terms of a, a concentrated mental force showing up within brain scans. So I don't think it's, it's too radical to use that term. We're seeing new frontiers, a new understanding of mental force within studies of the placebo response. There are things going on today within placebo studies that even the founders of the field in its modern sense, it dawned as a modern field just after the Second World War, never would have fathomed, never would have fathomed. For example, um, there's a... Uh, psychologist uh, at Harvard named Ellen Langer. And Langer has just done extraordinary studies based upon giving people transparent and accurate information about the nature of their lives that they might not have been aware of and watching the information itself, just the cognition of the information itself events physical changes in their lives. Now, for example, several years ago, Langer did a study of uh, hotel mates. She and some of her colleagues came to the realization that many people who worked as hotel mates uh, experienced um, obesity, high blood pressure, 
um, a poor um, fat to muscle body mass ratio. And she wondered why that would be. Because the fact is, people who are employed as hotel maids are doing, they're on their feet all day. You know, they're doing aerobic and anaerobic activities all day long, pushing vacuum cleaners, climbing up, up and down stairs, uh, you know, changing beds, they're scrubbing. It's a tough job. And they're very physically active. So why isn't that reflected in their physiology? So Langer and her colleagues gathered together a group of hotel maids to participate in a study. One group was a control group. The, the control group just, just for several weeks went about their business, went about their jobs um, as though nothing had changed. That was that, okay? The study group was given accurate information about the aerobic and anaerobic benefits of the physical labor that they were doing. And then they too were returned to their work no changes, no changes in domestic habits, no changes in eating or physical habits, no changes in work routines, nothing. They were given accurate information about the aerobic and anaerobic benefits of their work, and then they went back to their jobs. The group that was given information about the physical benefits of their labor demonstrated several weeks later weight loss, improved muscle tone, improved uh, muscle to body fat, ratio, and lowered blood pressure, as well as improved mood. Actual physical benefits, weight, muscle, blood pressure, measurable benefits associated with the reversal of, of age or stress-related diseases, based on nothing other than having been given informa accurate information about the physical benefits of their job. Langer likewise did a study, this goes back to 1981, in which she took groups of elderly people and she put them into situations, living situations, that we might consider nostalgic, that were filled with furniture and media and reminders of things that they experienced when they were youthful. And after several weeks in this living situation, what she found was that again, things that we associate with age-related decline had reversed. Blood pressure, muscle mass, balance had improved, body fat to muscle ratio had improved, and even eyesight had improved. Even eyesight had improved. She repeated the study a couple of times in different settings. Now, I would add that I think that, um, I don't know if it's novelty, I don't know if it's nostalgia so much that's the trigger, you know, putting people in circumstances that evoke their youth, it might be novelty that's, that's the trigger, which might be something to, to, to consider. But in any case, environment itself and the mood and circumstance of the individual was sufficient to evince actual physical changes in the body. I'll mention one more recent placebo study. In um, 2010, there was a so-called honest placebo study, a transparent placebo study at Harvard Medical School. A group of sufferers of irritable bowel syndrome were again divided into two groups. The control group received no treatment whatsoever. The active group received a transparently honest placebo. They were given an inert substance, a sugar pill, a nothing pill. And they were told this. They were told that they were receiving an inert substance, a substance of no pharmacological or medicinal value whatsoever. 59% of the people in the active group reported sustained and lasting belief compared to 35% in the control group, which statistically is a very, very significant difference in therapeutic studies. The researchers later repeated the study in Portugal. They took 97 sufferers of lower back pain. And for those of you who suffer from lower back pain, you know there's a real scale of, of difficulty with that problem. For some people, it's really disabling. It takes them off their feet. 
compromises their, their quality and their enjoyment of life. Again, people were divided into, into control groups where they were just left to their own devices and, and an active group where they were given a transparently inert substance. There was no decoy, there was no deception. They were very simply told, you know, we're giving you a substance that is, is inert, is, 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 is medicinally neutral. And substantial numbers of them reported increased flexibility, movement, reduction in pain. And then the researchers moved some of the people who had been in the control group into the active group, again, honestly dispensing to them in inert substance, and they got the same results. Which is very interesting, because what it tells us is that there is a, a manner in which hopeful expectancy can be triggered without deception or without decoy. The question is, you know, how can we trigger that, that sense of hopeful expectancy that seems to correlate to results? How can we trigger it? And there are other fields in which this has been observed too, including uh, academic psychical research, which I'm doing a whole evening on next week. It's called uh, the Parapsychology Revolution. And I'll be talking exclusively about ESP research, precognition research, but to put it in the briefest form, one of my heroes is an ESP researcher named J.B. Rhine, who founded the parapsycholo Parapsychology lab at Duke University in the early 1930s. And JB was famous for doing these card experiments with a five suit deck of cards where certain subjects attempting to guess which card would be laid down next and having a, a lawful chance of, of, of a one in five guess hit or 20% uh, hit rate if you're, if you're operating according to guesswork certain subjects would continually surpass over tens of thousands of trials uh, the twenty percent guess rate, and when you start to crunch these numbers over again you know, tens of thousands of trials, and you continually find certain individuals scoring twenty six percent, twenty seven percent, twenty eight percent, when eventually, eventually, the so called law of averages dictates that 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 you really can't surpass twenty percent over a certain uh, expenditure of time, you're, you're seeing some sort of anomalous transfer of information. You're seeing something exceptional go on in the individual's ability to glean information in a way that goes beyond ordinary sensory experience. And JB, JB Ryan, the founder of the uh, Duke Parapsychology Lab, he made the observation very fleetingly in the afterward to a, a British edition of his 1934 book, Extrasensory Perception. He made the observation that if there were to be any results at all, there seemed to, there seemed to need to be um, a feeling of high morale, a feeling of high spirits in the lab setting. If boredom would set in, if fatigue would set in, the results would dip. But then if they took a break, had a cup of coffee, had a conversation, whatever, and the subject felt uh, renewed, and the subject felt supported, and an atmosphere of conviviality prevailed in the lab, suddenly the results would spike again. And what was it? What was it? Again, hopeful expectancy seemed to be the key. The same thing that we're seeing in these placebo studies that I'm describing, the same thing that we're seeing arguably in neuroplasticity, the same effects that we're seeing in an emotionally neutral atmosphere, so I presume, uh, within the quantum physics lab, although I must say that that's an assumption on my part. You know, it, it could be that, that, that mood and emotion, you know, play some role uh, within that data in the same way that they do in uh, psychical research, neuroplasticity, mind-body medicine, and the placebo response. Could be. Where we're able to correlate um, mental state to event, the correlation is usually some sort of hopeful expectancy. So the transparent placebo uh, experiment tells us that 
hopeful expectancy, feelings of high morale. These things can be cultivated in ways that don't require uh, deception or delusion. So then the question becomes, um, if you agree that this is a worthwhile effort, how do you cultivate that sense of, of hopeful expectancy? How? And that's been the challenge, I would say, for the positive thinking movement for almost all of its existence. You know, people will talk in terms of prayer. Uh, people will talk in terms of affirmations, of visualizations, the power of suggestion. And I've written about many of these things, and I think that all of those things have efficacy. I think all of those things have efficacy. I think mantras have efficacy. I think anything that cultivates a focused mental state has efficacy, but rather than go through methods you know, with you, which I write about in my book, The Miracle Club, and, and other places, and I'm, I'm very embracing of, of, of practical methods. I think that, that, that these, these methods are, are, are worthy of a lifetime. But let me go back to where I started which is the value of self-expression. It seems to me, it seems to me that nothing does more to short circuit your sense of morale, purpose, possibility, selfhood, than being told what you're supposed to find or how you're supposed to live or what your spiritual values are supposed to be or what the spiritual search is supposed to be about. It seems to me that part of part of the, the the search, part of the endeavor to live within this very potent stream of hopeful expectancy, or call it something else, a sense of morale, a sense of purposeful persistence. a sense of agency. Part of the success of that, of that effort, of that endeavor, rests upon moving in the direction of something that's really, really important to you on an intimate, personal, private scale. And it seems to me that Concepts of faith, uh, which is a hard principle, I think, to define. Concepts of faith, it seems to me, are very bound up with what we would call persistence. I think that meaningful persistence brings faith. Meaningful persistence brings faith. It's very difficult to describe what is hope, what is faith, what is a belief that all will turn out well in the end. You know, I don't really possess any of those things. Um, if anything, you know, I've struggled my whole life with anxiety. That's probably why I wound up dedicating myself to the field of positive mind metaphysics. I've never really suffered from depression, but anxiety is what gets me, you know, and it's no joke. Um, it's easy for me to smile about it when I'm giving a presentation to a bunch of people who I dig and who are co-seekers with me, but it's not something I'm smiling about at four o'clock in the morning when I'm trying to sleep, I can assure you. And my mind is always going. And um, I remember years ago, I was giving a talk at this very wealthy um, retirement community in upstate New York. And um, after I finished the, the talk, this woman came up to me and she said, how do you sleep at night? And I thought, you know, she was insulting me as if like, you know, there was something morally objectionable I had done or said. <laughs> I said, excuse me? She said, 
how do you sleep at night? You know, your brain, it's always going. And I said, oh, yeah, you know, right on. You're correct. You know, it's, it's a problem. You know, I don't sleep very much. So, you know, the question is, if I'm dealing with anxiety, okay, which has been a lifelong struggle for me, where does um, the sensation come from of hopeful expectancy, of, uh, of faith? of, uh, uh, of um, an expectation of great things, which seems to be, as we've been reviewing, the trigger, if there is one, that, that draws a correlation between mental state and event. It comes from meaningful persistence. It comes from meaningful persistence. The kind of experience that I was describing in connection with my pink heart-shaped buckets story. There was a totality of experience. My full psyche was in the game, and I use the term psyche with care, because to me that's a compact of your thoughts and your emotions. Thoughts and emotions run on different tracks. They're different things. If thoughts ruled the day, then nobody would have a problem with anger. Nobody would have a problem with addiction. Nobody would have a problem with overeating or whatever it may be because your thoughts would say well don't do that or avoid that or whatever but our thoughts don't rule the day our emotions rule the day our physicality rules the day and we we can't talk ourselves out of a mood exactly we can't talk ourselves out of a craving we can use our minds to help circumvent that mood or to help circumvent that craving but those things are enormously powerful and they have to be given their due you know they run on their own tracks and, you know, we do owe something to them as well. They, they have to be given their due, you know. They're not just to be corralled and, and reorganized in some way. You know, cravings and emotions are also meaningful in their way. And so, it, but, it, but, I, but I, I, I point this out to highlight the fact that thought is not in the driver's seat. There's a lot of different things going on in our lives and a lot of different pulls and... and needs making themselves felt and demanding our attention. But when I say the psyche, I think it's a compact of thought and emotion. It's the totality of your psychology. And it's only aroused when you're moving in the direction of something that you truly, truly want. Which is why I think of desires as a turnkey to life. I think of desires as something that is central to the human experience. It doesn't liberate you. A desire doesn't liberate you from things that are owed to other people, from ethical obligations, from reciprocity. Not at all. But a desire does point you in the direction of a kind of psychical authenticity. And it should be attended to, heeded, noted. Don't let it get taken away from you. Because persistence in the direction of desire is what seems to me to heighten, to summon the passions that we call faith expectation belief in self belief in the greater possibility of the individual of you of you it's that psychical compact so that which you feel with your whole psyche and which you move towards in every effortful way as I was describing earlier, seems to pull back a pendulum which must lawfully move towards the direction of that which is concentrated on. And that's not just a pretty metaphor. I'm speaking in terms of hermetic philosophy. I'm speaking in terms of concepts that appear within Greek Egyptian hermeticism, but that are validated by findings in all the scientific fields that I've just mentioned, 
and that are validated by the testimony of seekers stretched across centuries. And I've provided you with a testimony of my own in the, in the short anecdote that I related to you. So it seems to me, to go back to the challenge that Christopher Lash uh, had issued and that I described at the beginning of, of this talk, you know, what is this material for? Is it some sort of an escape from life or unwillingness to abide by limits, barriers, an unwillingness to bow to or acknowledge frustrations? Is it a form of narcissism, an escape, a delusion? I believe in actuality that philosophies that elevate, that frame, that encourage our movement towards self-expression heighten our existence, bring meaning, focus, concentration, beingness to our existence. They not only abet our selfhood, these things are the foundation of our selfhood. And whatever it is that you wish to move in the direction of is exquisitely private. It's meaningful to you on terms that you as a mature person don't need to justify uh, to me or to anybody else. The things that people wish for in life, and I ask you to think very carefully, think very carefully tonight about what it is that you truly wish for in life, should never be a source of uh, embarrassment or correction because those things may come from a place of very deep and profound wish. Think about w what your fantasies were, what you wished for at the youngest of ages, you know, uh, at an age like when you first began to form long-term memories, when you first began to form conscious cognition what were your what were your wishes what were your fantasies what were your dreams when you were three years old four years old ages at which you know we have some of our earliest cognitive references that we've retained you know within long-term memory obviously we have earlier memories but they might be non-verbal they might be non-visual they might be emotional and that's extremely important but it's so precious and valuable to think back to those earliest, earliest memories before peer pressure started to fully get us in its grips. You know, I think probably when a kid, it's probably earlier nowadays with social media, but probably when a kid is um, about nine years old, uh, he or she begins to feel the gravitational pull of peer pressure in a way that never quite lets go. And it's pernicious because peer pressure gets inside our heads too. And sometimes the things that we wish for, the things that we, I should say, the things that we repeat back to ourselves, our inner voice, the things that we say habitually and by rote, that really can just be internalized peer pressure. You know, we might feel a need to repeat things to ourselves that uh, we think make us look good to other people, you know, even though. Uh, these dialogues are going on within the most private confines of our minds, we internalize a great deal of peer pressure. But we can catch a glimpse of ourselves prior to that internalization, I think, at ages three, four. And I ask you, maybe this very night, this very night, to allow, allow yourself to, to go back to those earliest, earliest memories. And I believe you'll find within them something of your absolutely essential self. And then... Come back to the present and ask yourself whether you are in the ways that 
that we've been considering psychically, industriously, in all ways, you know, moving in the direction of your, of your wishes. And if you are, I, I say, bravo. I, I would, I would, I would extend my, uh, I would extend my my neck out by saying you've probably had some very good experiences. And if you find that you're not, and you feel a drift, it may be that moving in that direction is the very thing that you've been looking for, not only for a sense of meaning, direction, purpose, but the striving itself, as we've been considering, the striving itself, the focus itself, seems to have causative agencies and abilities. Seems to be an act of selection. Everything that I've been describing in terms of the mind's capacities, I don't use the term attraction, I don't use the term manifestation, those aren't terms that I, I really think in. I don't think they're precise enough. And I don't think they reflect everything that's going on. But I speak rather in terms of measurement, in terms of selection. And I think you, as an autonomous psyche, have capacities for measurement and selection. And my message to you tonight is use them. Use them. And let us search together. And I thank you all very much. It's a uh, it's been a great pleasure and privilege to be able to uh, share this time with you tonight. And uh, I see by the clock we, we have some time left, and I'd be very, very happy to uh, hear uh, yeah. questions, comments, reflections, uh, anything at all you'd like to put in the chat box. And I've noticed some of the comments in the chat box, and I'm very grateful you know, for, for some of the observations that you all have made. And uh, I, 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 I'm not able to, to, to look at it with the degree of detail that I would like to, but I am catching the comments and I'm, I'm very grateful. And I'd like to turn things back over to Dave and maybe you could select some sure. uh, questions from the chat and I'd be very happy to engage them and feel free to continue to put things in the chat box as, 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 uh, as we go through our, uh, our exchange. Excellent, well, thank you so much, Mitch. Um, well, first of all, I should just uh, briefly say that uh, Mitch did uh, have a uh, recent uh, course you can sign up for on the theosophical.org site on his modern occultism and that's something that looks uh to be extremely interesting for people who who love to follow Mitch's way of uh uh producing such uh absorbable chunks of great wisdom so uh, we have a question here from Alex uh McDonald um he's grateful for you being here tonight um, thank you and he couldn't help but smile throughout because yeah, he had a number of questions with very specific uh, questions or very specific questions prepared. And uh, without fail, you kept covering them, that being neuroplasticity, <laughs> quantum entanglement. Okay, and, good. Yeah, and uh, one leftover question though. Uh, he is a seeker and an undergrad at the California Institute of Integral Studies. And in his neurobiology studies, he's come across uh, one relatively recent discovery in particular that seems to have powerful implications for supporting causative thought and that's epigenetics. Uh, the study of epigenetics have it proven that although our genetic code is written at birth, events and influences in our life um, will determine which portions of our code are turned on and which are turned off. The implication is that our genetics are in flux and somewhat malleable. Uh, considering that, I'm wondering if you've heard any discussion about the potential of causative thought on genetic expression. Uh, what are your thoughts? Well, that's a wonderful uh, observation. Um, I'm I, I I I'm not familiar with the field of epigenetics. I've heard of it. Um, I've I've heard of the thesis, but I haven't looked into it. And I'm I'm eager to learn more about it. Uh, in fact, Alex, I, I appreciate you bringing it up, and I would invite you to email me um, if there are some citations that you could share about it. Uh, if you go to my website, MitchHorowitz.com, you'll find uh, my email there, and and I would I would appreciate hearing from you about that. Um, it, it is very interesting to me as a parent to hear that. I, I have two adolescent sons, and I remember uh, having had the indelible experience, and I've heard other parents speak about this as well, of feeling that uh, when the kids were born, they were born 
with very discernible personality traits. Uh, characterologically, they were all there, you know, already. <laughs> and, you know, their temperament was already clear, you know, even just coming out of the womb. And a lot of people have made this observation. And, and when we get into the whole nature versus nurture debate, it seems to me that temperamentally, uh, we are such complete beings when we come into the world and, 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 and perhaps that makes conditioning all the more important in the sense that who we are uh, meshes or clashes uh, or in various ways maybe goes back and forth between meshing and clashing with the childhood environment in which we find ourselves. And so the stakes are tremendously high because if, 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 a, if a child is born into an environment that he or she just doesn't appropriately mesh with, it's going to be just a, 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 a huge uh, epic of, of friction over the course of that, of that child's life. And I'm so struck, I'm so struck by the very distinct personality traits, characterological traits, temperaments that I observed in my two kids from earliest infancy. And um, it's interesting, the, um, there's a paranormal writer, Hans Holzer, who uh, makes the argument that if you use the principle of uh, Occam's razor, which says that the simplest answer that covers all the bases is likely to be correct, he said, you know, the phenomenon that I'm just describing is a pretty good argument on behalf of reincarnation. <laughs> because if you've had this, 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 these other existences and there's some sort of transmigration or something, you know, going on, uh, if there's some sort of e uh, uh, recurrence uh, going on, it would serve to explain not only why individuals come into this sphere of existence with such fully formed characterological traits, but why those traits seem so implacable over the course of a lifetime. You can go to a therapist, you can go to a religious counselor, what have you, but certain traits uh, are uh, always present in, in, in your life. They crop up again and again in your relationships. There seems to be this implacable temperamental quality with which we enter the world. So Holzer said that if you use the theory of Occam's razor reincarnation, a belief that is, is held by vast numbers of people around the world, maybe uh, under different terminology, eternal recurrence, transmigration, so forth, he said, you know, it's, 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 it, it can be a pretty persuasive argument for that. But, but epigenetics sounds to me like it's a persuasive argument as well. So I'm eager to learn more about that. Great. Thank you, Mitch. Um, from KC. Hi, Mitch. I'm encountering lots of information on the importance of feelings, having recently begun some of Goddard's readings. Uh, what do you think are the most effective, uh, effective ways to refine feelings and focus on such desired feelings in a practical, everyday manner? Yeah, that's a wonderful question. Um, uh, what's being spoken of is the work of Neville Goddard, uh, who I have tattooed uh, on my arm, and he's been a huge influence on me. Um, Neville taught that uh, our, our feelings, our feeling states are projected out into life and everything that you experience are your emotionalized thoughts or feeling states uh, concretized or outpictured into the world. So within Neville's system, uh, um, entering into a feeling state is 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 the royal road to mental causation or mental creativity. Um, I've wrestled with that a lot. There's a new book I'm writing called Daydream Believer where I take up that question. You know, I love Neville and Neville was an enormous and continues to be an enormous source of influence uh, on me. I do think sometimes that Neville, uh, who was prior to his career as, as a mystical writer, thinker, teacher, Neville was a, an actor and a stage performer. And I think Neville sometimes um, underestimated uh, the barriers that the individual could face in engineering a kind of feeling state in him or herself. You know, I, Neville was kind of a natural thespian. And Neville would describe going into a very quiet state of physical immobility, of meditation, and coming into the, the, the feeling of his wish fulfilled or coming into the tactile, palpable feeling of being, dwelling, living from the end of some circumstance that he wished to experience. And I think what Neville wrote about this 
was tremendously effective and true and sincere and powerful. But I think sometimes, due to his own background as a thespian, Neville underestimated the difficulty that, that the individual could experience in engineering those, those feeling states in him or herself. Um, so one of the things that I'm working with in this book, Daydream Believer, is the question of whether, in fact, the feeling state is absolutely necessary. But if we are beings who are possessed of mentally causative or selective abilities, is it possible, is it possible that the wish alone, the deeply felt, focused, concentrated wish alone is sufficient to accomplish the thing that the feeling state accomplishes in Neville's system? Because we're really talking about selection. And Neville felt that, that your emotionalized thoughts, your palpably felt uh, mental pictures were the turnkeys to selection. Those are the, the tools of perspective. And I think that's true. I think that's absolutely true. But when the individual is suffering from grief or anxiety or depression, <sighs> coming into that feeling state can seem very, very distant, very, very far away at a time when the individual is most acutely in need of help. So is this some cruel joke that Mother Nature has played on us? Is this some, some cosmic catch-22 where when we are in our most deeply felt state of need, we experience the greatest barriers to grasping the key that's gonna get us out of it, which is adopting the feeling state of something else something more ideal. That would seem to me to be a, a, a cruel conundrum to be stuck in. So one of the things I've wondered is that if we do have psyches that have the capacity for selection and measurement, if we do have the capacity for mental causation, which I think is, is incontrovertible, even though there are many complexities that play within that, then perhaps the focused wish in and of itself is enough to to set those possibilities in motion. So I know that doesn't directly respond to your question, but that's one of the things, one of the things I'm, I'm working with. Um, I think there are different ways and methods of engineering the emotional state. There's a, a Neville anthology that I edited and introduced called The Ideal Realized. And in The Ideal Realized, I deal with some of Neville's most practical instructions for engineering that emotional state. And I honor that, I honor it. But, but I'm wondering if there are other ways as well uh, that, that, that might get us on that royal road. Fantastic. Thank you. And I, I enjoy, I think, a monkey's reference there with Daydream Believer, right? Yeah, that's right. Okay, yeah, good. Yeah, right. <laughs> nice. Uh, the monkeys are never far away from my psyche. <laughs> that's the way it <laughs> yeah. is. My yeah. first concert, actually. But uh, Oh, okay. no kidding. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's right. Where did you see them? Uh, it was called the Shoreline Amphitheater in Mountain View, California. I saw them in Weird Al. <laughs> That's a trip. Wow. Well, for those of you who have read The Miracle Club or plan to, I write about the monkeys in there. And also I write about the monkeys in my book, The Miracle of a Definite Chief Aim. I have a very strange intersection with the monkeys. So um, <laughs> I met Mickey, Mickey Dolan's not long ago in an airport in Kansas City. And, you know, <laughs> and uh, you know, he, he kept looking at me very searchingly like he knew me. <laughs> it was a funny sort of experience. I haven't written about that yet. But anyway, I talk about the monkeys um, in Miracle Club. Fantastic. And then uh, a very kind of generalized question. What is your take on the law of attraction? Well, I think it's valid, you know, because of all the things that I've been talking about. I, I don't use the term myself because I think that um, I think that too frequently in our culture, uh, the term law of attraction gets used as this one overall mental super law. And, you know, as I've been trying to, to drive at, there are so many different laws and forces, you know, that, that we have to contend with in this world. And, you know, like I'm just reading today about um, the nation of Haiti, for example, is dealing with like terrible gang violence. And I reject unequivocally that that's because of the, you know, mental vibrations of the Haitian population. I think that, no, you know, it's because of 
geography and politics and slavery and colonialism and economics and economic underdevelopment and the COVID crisis and, you know, a whole bunch of different things. And, you know, I, I think we live in a very, very complex world. And if we try to speak in terms of one mental super law, I think we paint ourselves very quickly into philosophical corners that we can't get out of. So it's not that I'm down on the term. It's not that I'm down on it conceptually. It's just that I think colloquially it's come to me in one mental super law and, you know, my perspective is different. Excellent. And then uh, we had another question, um, kind of a general one as well. Um, I think you actually covered that one about uh, man is created in the image of God and the implications of that. And it goes towards the beginning of your talk. But uh, perhaps you would like to tell us a little bit more about the upcoming film. Uh, Oh, the Kabbalion. Uh, yeah, thanks for asking. Um, the Kabbalion is an occult classic that was written in 1908, and it was a book that uh, for years I kind of half ignored. I thought, well, you know, it's just kind of new thought dressed up uh, to look like ancient Hermetic or ancient Egyptian philosophy. And then for a variety of strange reasons, I returned to the book, and I read it about five times in, in the space of one summer. And I came to feel that it really is a good, sturdy iteration of some psychological and spiritual principles that the author William Walker Atkinson had distilled from Greek Egyptian uh, Hermeticism. And that it's actually a book of, of unique value and, 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 and some degree of authentic historical retention. And so uh, I collaborated with director Ronnie Thomas on a documentary about the Kabbalion, both its background and, more importantly, its application. And uh, we, we filmed uh, on location in Egypt, which was very exciting. We went there at the beginning of 2019, so that was, that was pre-COVID, and um, uh, worked very hard on the film, and Ronnie did just an extraordinary job. Uh, and we have a distributor, and it's coming out in January of 2022. Um, I'm not certain at this point, you know, what platforms it's going to be on, but I'll be announcing that on social media. And, uh, you know, it's, 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 it's about two or three months away, so it's imminent. And, and I think it's a very exciting movie that uh, looks at the application of the seven hermetic principles and ideas found within the Kabbalion and how you can apply them in life. Well, we're looking forward to that. Um, a couple of comments. Uh, so uh, Sophia says, yeah, she truly appreciates the time and care you put into these thoughts and all your work. Uh, thank you. Also, uh, Occult America needs to be made into a series. Oh, thank you. Yeah, <laughs> I'd like that. And then uh, Linda said, it's always seemed to me that the trigger for things, as you describe in much uh, detail, was need. So thank you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, necessity is, is an extraordinary force, and um, uh, we never reach the limits of our strength, it seems to me, and, and sometimes when faced with necessity, uh, we discover folds within ourselves that we never knew were there. Uh, William Blake wrote, opposition is true friendship. Opposition is true friendship, and it's, it's really worth living with that, with that principle. That's fantastic. Um, and then Casey follows up. Uh, that was an excellent answer to your que uh, her question or his question. Uh, I think uh, you're correct, and it may be helpful to think about Neville's thoughts on feeling as more of a single component of multiple practices, methods, jointly considered and combined in a way that is optimal for the individual. Uh, I appreciate your invaluable perspective always. Yeah, I think that's beautifully put. And I really like the spirit of, of what Casey wrote because I think that we, we can't get into uh, calcification or orthodoxy. You know, we can't start throwing the book at people, you know, basically. And I see that, you know, that creeps into our alternative spiritual culture the same way it does in mainstream culture. You know, people will say to me, you know, well, you're into tarot and Neville said tarot was blah, 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 blah. And before you know it, we're starting to get into these very uh, kind of calcified religious attitudes where literally or figuratively we're sort of throwing the book at one another as though to say, you know, that's that's heretical, that's outside the beam, that's not what the man said, that's not this, that's not that. And 
what's the purpose of there being an alternative spiritual culture if we're just going to recreate, you know, the orthodoxy that that many of us came here to flee from, you know? So, so I really appreciate what Casey wrote because I think that's that's the spirit of the search. Fantastic. Well, uh, that pretty much covers up a lot of uh, the questions. And uh, thanks again, Mitch, uh, for this Thank evening. You. That was wonderful. I got uh, a couple messages directly. People asking, uh, "When can we do this again?" Um, you know, and of course, they can go to MitchHorowitz.com and find a load of material from other lectures that you've put out recently. And like we said, there was the uh, Theosophical Society course that just got released on video, and uh, just a lot of a lot of Mitch Horowitz for everyone <laughs> out you. there in, in internet land. So, but we hope to have you back, uh, Mitch, and a recording will be sent out in about 48 hours to everyone who's attended. And uh, once again, thank you everyone for showing up tonight. It was a wonderful talk, and Mitch, thank you so much for the inspiration. Thank you. A real pleasure. Great to be with you all. Thank you very much. Good night, everyone. Good night. See you again. Thank you.